Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History, World History Edition. This time we're traveling back to Europe in the 1920s to take a look at the rise of fascism. So whether you're a kid that's in school or if you're a lifelong learner, maybe you're even cray cray on the internet, we're glad that you're watching. So let's go do a little bit of the giddying up for the learning right about now. All right, guys, before we jump into the actual history and we take a look at the rise of Mussolini and the rise of Hitler, we want to make sure that you understand on a very basic level what fascism is. At its root, fascism is loyalty to the state and obedience to the ruler. And sometimes people will equate fascism with communism. And certainly there are some similarities when we look at the two. Both of them kind of equate to totalitarianism, where you have one man rule. You have an authoritarian regime. And in both instances, you're gonna lose your rights, brother. You're not gonna have all those freedoms that you love so, so much. But there are some distinctions between a fascist and a communist. Number one, fascists believe in a class-based society. There are rich, there are poor, there might be collaboration between these classes, but they exist. They exist for the state, but they exist. And it's also nationalistic. It's very much concentrated on the state, on the country, on the nation, where a communist is really centered on the international, like the kind of spreading of communism. And there's also a classless society in theoretical communism. They try to abolish classes so everybody is equal. Maybe we could say that communism is more idealistic and fascism is more realistic. Now, in fascism, in a sense, you have a covenant, a covenant, a relationship between the people and the authoritarian regime, and that this covenant, which asks for not only loyalty to the state, but to loyalty of the leader, you will be given something in return. You will be given a stronger economy. You will be given lost lands. You will be given your nationalism. There's this kind of emphasis on restoring national pride, something that once was. It might be the Reich system, right? It's the Third Reich, because the first and the Second Reich were awesome. Or in Mussolini's case, he's constantly talking about ancient Rome and how awesome Italy is. So there's that in common as well. And there's generally something that is kind of blaming somebody. There's going to be an idea that we need to punish those responsible for that lost greatness, for the position that we're in now. But at the end of the day, it's authoritarianism, it is totalitarianism, it is obedience to the leader and obedience to the state. Now let's take a look at two examples in terms of the rise of fascism in Europe in the 1920s. Okay. All right, guys, why don't we start with Benito Mussolini. If you want to call him El Duce, you can call him that as well, meaning the leader. And of course, he's going to be the leader of Italy as we go throughout the 1920s, 1930s into World War II. He took over in 1922. He was appointed by King Victor Emmanuel III after something called the March on Rome, where him and about 30,000 of his black shirt peeps marched on Rome. And the king was like, whoa, we're going to give that dude power. But of course, there's background, there's context, there's something in the war that allows this for it to happen. And we really can kind of narrow that down to, let's say, four things. Number one, bad economy. Whenever there's a bad economy, people are looking for a savior, and that's going to be Benito Mussolini, who's going to really be an industrialist. He's going to align himself with corporate interests, with the landowners, to control the economy when he takes over. Number two, you need to fear somebody. And they feared the communists in Italy. There was a fear, especially amongst the middle class and the landowners and the business owners that if the communists took over like they took over in Russia, eeks, that's bad news. So we need a strong man, someone to protect us from the communists. You also have a series of bad democracies. You have to remember that most of these European countries don't have a lot of experimentation with democracy. So democracies are going to be fledging. There's going to be a lot of changing governments. There's going to be a weak infrastructure in the government that's going to allow someone like Benito Mussolini to step into power. Not to mention these weak democracies can't solve many of these major problems like the economy, like the fear of communism that Benito Mussolini is going to be able to do. And there's also, number four, going to be some kind of slight, some kind of loss of national pride. And that occurred in 1919 at the Paris Peace Treaty, where Italy was supposed to get gravy, and they got a rock. That's all they got. In fact, they lost some land in the Treaty of Paris when it was given to Yugoslavia. Who gives anything to Yugoslavia? I'm sorry if you have roots in Yugoslavia. And you have to remember that Italy picked the right side. They picked the right side in World War I. 1915, they signed the Treaty of London, where they sided with England and France in World War I. They're normally aligned with the Central Powers, with Germany, Hungary, and Austria. So they picked the winner. 
but they didn't get the gravy. They got the rock, remember? So all of these attributes are going to allow someone like Benito Mussolini to rise to power. Now, Benito Mussolini originally was a socialist. He served in World War I. He was an idealistic kind of guy in the sense of he believed in the classless society. But that kind of turned sour for him when he returned to Italy in 1917, believing that socialism didn't have the answers, that we needed a class-based society. And he was especially more interested in the nation of Italy and empire building than he was of this international theoretical concept of communism around the globe. So that's going to make him into a fascist rather than a communist. He actually uh, worked for the MI5, the British Intelligence Service, during World War I in 1917. He was given money in order to pump out pro-war propaganda and to turn in anti-war protesters as well. In 1919, he forms the fascist party made up of black shirts. These were they called his supporters. He only about 200 of them. But as the economy gets worse and the fear of communism grows, that number is going to grow into 30,000 by 1922 when he institutes the March on Rome and then King Victor Emmanuel III hands power over to him as prime minister. As prime minister, he's going to finagle new elections where his fascist party is going to win, sometimes because they're going to kill their opponents. But nevertheless, by the time we get to 1924, 1925, El Duce is the leader of Italy in every sense of the word. So what does he do now that he has power? What does a fascist do when you give him control? Well, they abolish democracy. Um, they get secret police. It was called the OVRA in Italy. These secret police are going to be the enforcers of the government. They're going to arrest opposition. They're going to murder political opponents. They're going to jail anybody that's suspect. They're going to censor the radios and the newspapers. In fact, they're going to control the radio and the newspapers and all forms of media to pump out pro Benito Mussolini propaganda. They're going to outlaw unions and outlaw strikes. They're going to align themselves with industrialists in order to do these great great, huge public work projects. You have to remember that fascism is rooted in national pride. So when Mussolini is talking, he's talking a lot about Julius Caesar and Plato and these great Romans and the empire of Rome and how we need to restore that. We need to make Italy great again. He's going to make teachers take oaths. He's going to institute a educational plan called Futurism, where we're really concentrating in the schools on loyalty oaths and patriotism and kind of warfare and teaching people that sort of thing to make Italy great again. And there's also this cult of personality in fascism around the leader. Benito Mussolini was seen by the people that supported him as a godlike figure, that everything he listened to and everything that he said was golden. And he's also going to have the support of the Catholic Church, which is really important in Italy, mostly Catholic. He converts to be a Catholic. He signs a treaty with the Vatican. And now he has complete power. It's a one-man and show as we head into World War II, and then we're going to talk about more groovy stuff about Benito Mussolini as we do those lectures in the future. There's another guy, kind of like Benito Mussolini, but he's still going to call himself a socialist. The guy, his name is Adolf Hitler, and let's take a look at Adolf right now. All right, guys, let's turn our attention to Germany post-World War I and the rise of fascism and, of course, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was born in Austria in 1889. He was a high school dropout. He was an artist. He tried that game for a little while. Fortunately, that didn't work out. But he was a really good soldier. He fought in World War I. He was awarded the Iron Cross twice. And then after the war, he becomes, like many Germans, disillusioned over the Treaty of Versailles. He believes that this is beyond the pale, that not only is it a slight at their economy, at their land and their territory, but at the very heart of German nationalism and German pride. So he ends up getting involved in right-wing politics. He moves to Munich, where there is a political organization called the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or they were called the Nazis. And quite quickly, he rises through their ranks. He was an awesome leader in terms of being a speaker, his oratory power, his organizational power, his ability to get people to believe in him. And you have to remember that fascism has this cult of personality kind of thing going on. So if you were that, that personality, like a Benito Mussolini, like Adolf Hitler was, you can, you can quite quickly rise through the ranks. And quite quickly, only a few years after joining the party in 1923, his new nickname is Der Führer, the leader of the Nazis. So he sees what happens with the March on Rome with Benito Mussolini and 
how that was successful. So he figures he's gonna try the same type of deal in Munich. And this is called the Beer Hall Pooch. The Beer Hall Pooch, which occurred in 1923, is Hitler's attempt to have a coup d'etat. That's an awesome word, an overthrow of government. The coup d'etat. I could even be saying it wrong, but I don't care. And he thinks this will be successful. This will launch him into being the leader of all Germany. No, it won't. You get crushed. And really, this was an opportunity to shut down Adolf Hitler. They try him for treason. In some countries, when you're tried for treason, that's the last trial of your life because they're gonna probably chop your head off or something like that. But not Adolf Hitler. He had sympathetic judges, people that you know were kind of on his side, and he was sentenced to five years in jail. He only served nine months in jail. And at the end of the day, the Beerhold Putsch is actually a positive for Adolf Hitler. This failed rebellion, the failed coup d'etat, is really gonna give him what he wants. It's gonna give him national attention, at the trial, it's going to give him the opportunity to have a platform to announce his intentions and his blueprints and what he wants. And it's also going to give him a little time. A lot of people in prison like to read books. Adolf Hitler likes to write books. So he writes My Life Struggle or Mein Kampf, which is really the blueprint for the Nazis for the Third Reich, which is what his future entails. And in Mein Kampf, that blueprint for the Third Reich, he's really outlining a few big ideas. One is that there is a distinction in race, that there are some people that are better than other people. And he calls those people Aryans. So if you were blonde hair and blue eyed, you're the perfect German Aryan and you are the master race. And you really, in a sense, it's like social Darwinism. You were given the great leadership skills and power and the best physique. You should be ruling the universe. And then there's non-Aryans. There's gypsies and blacks and the Jews and all of the other races, which are subhuman in a sense. And they're there for our benefit or if we want their destruction. But that's one huge idea in Mein Kampf. And of course, it's gonna be the Jews that take much of the blame for the woes of Germany in Mein Kampf. Even though they're less than 1% of the population, they're blamed for the Treaty of Versailles, they're blamed for the economy, they're blamed for the military losses, they're blamed for everything. You also have this idea of that Treaty of Versailles in Mein Kampf. A lot of it talks about how the Treaty of Versailles is destroying Germany and how Germany needs needs to get rid of the Treaty of Versailles, to get out of the Treaty of Versailles. And of course, a lot of that is going to be centered around expansionism and militarism. And you also have this idea of expansionism, or Lebensraum, and I mispronounced that word. It's called living space. But the idea was it was just too crowded, that Germans deserved more because they were better than everybody, so they really needed to be looking into Eastern Europe and into Russia to expand their empire. And the last thing that his time in prison taught him was that he didn't want to go to prison again, that really he needed to develop political power, and that he needed to use propaganda to get the German people on his side so he could take power legally. And remember, folks, Hitler takes power legally. In 1932, really, the economy is going to implode because of the stopping of American loans. We have our own economic depression, the Great Depression. We certainly can't be giving bank loans to Germany, and that really was holding the Weimar Republic together by a thread. They're the ones that led Germany from 1919 to 1933. But by 1932, now unemployment is 30 percent. The factories are closing, the banks are closing, the kids are eating mud pies. There's a demand for change. And there's a fear of communism. That's where communism grows when you have extreme recession, economic depression. So the conservatives that were in power at that point thought that their only out was to use someone like Adolf Hitler. The conservatives thought they could control Adolf Hitler. So he is given the title of chancellor by President Paul von Hindenburg in 1933 in January. And now as chancellor, he is the legal leader of Germany. He's gonna use his power to call for new elections. Those new elections are gonna be corrupt. In fact, six days before those elections in 1934, the Reichstag burned down and the Nazis blamed the communists and they won a very, very slight majority, but enough of a slight majority to give Adolf Hitler total power. And he's gonna use his new political power to pass through something called the Enabling Acts. And the Enabling Acts are going to give him complete 
power, the power to form the SS, his secret police, the power to put together the stormtroopers and the Gestapo, the power to censor media, to ban newspapers, to ban political opponents, to burn books, to dissolve unions, and yes, to create public work projects, which is going to satisfy most Germans. Unemployment drops from 6 million people out of work to about a million people out of work quite rapidly because the German people are being put to work. They're building cars, they're building highways, they're building new buildings. And that, in a sense, is going to be the buffer between losing your liberty, knowing that you have a job. And that's going to keep Adolf Hitler in power, not to mention his control over the youth. He's going to start something called the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls, which are going to basically brainwash children to be little servants of Adolf Hitler. And of course, the anti-Semitism. Jews are the scapegoat for Adolf Hitler. He's laying all of the blame at their feet and is using his new power now to focus going on them. In 1933, the Nazis are going to push something through called the Nuremberg Laws, which are going to strip Jews of their citizenship, of their right to go to public schools. They're going to be segregated. They're going to be uh, not allowed to go to restaurants and movie theaters, much like apartheid in South Africa. They're seen as a subclass. And you didn't get to pick whether you were a Jew or not. Your Jewish ancestry was based on your grandparents. So even if you were reformed or you were an atheist or you joined a different religion, it didn't matter. The Jews were going to be labeled with that yellow star of David and they were going to be treated differently. So from 1933 to 1938, there's this erosion of Jewish rights as Hitler builds his power, as Hitler builds his approval ratings, as Hitler builds his propaganda engines. And then in 1938, there really is a shift. It's November 9th. It's called Krishnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, where his stormtroopers, his Gestapo, are going to start using force, brute force and violence to burn down Jewish businesses, to push Jews out of their home, to start sometimes executing them in the streets as we march closer and closer to the final solution. So that brings us to about 1938, guys. We're almost ready for World War II. We're going to stop it here as you understand, hopefully, something about fascism in Europe. And remember, guys, those are only the popular fascist regimes, the one that made the most headlines. You have fascism spreading all over Europe. You have it in Hungary and in Poland, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania, in fact, I think it's only Czechoslovakia, shout out to the Czechs, that are going to remain a democracy as we build up in Eastern Europe towards World War II. In fact, the only democracies are the Scandinavian countries and Britain and France, as, of course, we have totalitarian regimes in the Soviet Union, the former country known as Russia. So we hope that you understand something about fascism and the development of it in Italy with Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler in Germany. Of course, in the long run, it's not going to work out for these two gentlemen. They're going to meet their maker in 1945, but we're going to have to save that for another lecture. So giddy up for the learning, guys. We hope that your brain's a little bit bigger, and we'll see you next time that you press my buttons.